going to do this evening is just stand a little bit back from the Bible and not so much looking at what its message is about, but just to see how these particular books came together to form what we call the Bible. So it's a slightly different uh, address than normal. So we're going to ask some questions. Um, just First of all, just have a look at a very brief outline of the structure of the Bible, and then ask these questions, you know, how are these 66 books chosen? Uh, why are there only these particular books? Why not others? And how were they written? And more um, importantly, how did they come to be preserved uh, originally? So those are the questions that we're going to ask, and just a very brief outline of what the Bible is, the New Testament, the Old Testament, a pile of books. The uh, bottom part there is what is termed the law, and that spans from uh, BC 4000 to the time of the giving of the law, the time of Moses, about BC 1450. Then we have historical books, which deal with the history of Israel, and they mainly span from the time of the Exodus uh, on to after the return from the exile. We also have prophetical books written by prophets speaking of instruction for their people and also foretelling future things. And they span about the time period BC 700 to BC 400. And then there are the poetical books, of which the book of Job is the oldest, so that takes us back to about 1600 BC. Uh, and go forward about spelling about a thousand years of prophetical books. So that makes up our Old Testament. The New Testament is much briefer in time. We believe that uh, it's covering history from birth of the Lord Jesus to uh, John in the book of Revelation, and so just covers about a uh, hundred years. Uh, yes, a hundred years. So that's the the Bible. It's divided into the Old Testament and the New Testament, and if we look at things by pages, then about 76% of what we have in front of us is Old Testament, 24% being New Testament. If we look at it by the number of books, the New Testament books are a bit shorter, so we've got 39 books in the Old Testament, and we have 27 books, uh, hopefully, coming up in the New Testament. So, uh, although there were a lot more pages in the Old Testament, a much bigger section than the New Testament, in fact, in numbers of books, there's not a big difference between them. The books, as we have them in our uh, English Bible, are well known to us. Those are the list of the books there, the 39 books of the Old Testament and the 27 books of the New Testament. Uh, again, these are well known to us. The Hebrew Bible was slightly different. The Hebrew Bible contains all the Old Testament books, but obviously doesn't contain New Testament books, because the Hebrew Bible uh, came to an end in Old Testament times. But instead of the 39 books that we have in our Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible has exactly the same books, but some of them are amalgamated together so that in total there are 22 books, and that's by putting Samuel and 1st Kings, 2nd Kings are treated as one book, and Chronicles and Ezra and Nehemiah are treated as one book, and all the 12 minor, apostle, uh, minor prophets are treated as one book. So Hebrew Bible, exactly the same books, but they talk about 22 books in their Hebrew Bible. And that, interestingly, is the number of letters in the Hebrew alphabet. Now, the order of the books is different in the Hebrew Bible. Uh, they start off with the law, which covers the first five books of the Bible, the prophets and the Psalms. So we just put the books uh, there. So the law is Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. The prophets, we might be a bit surprised at what goes in the prophets, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, Samuel, Kings, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and the minor prophets. And what is termed the Psalms is fairly embracing, obviously the book of Psalms, the book of Proverbs, the book of Job, 
Song of Solomon, Lamentations, Ecclesiastes, Esther, Daniel, Ezra, uh, Nehemiah, and one and two Chronicles. But I stress it's the, the same number of books just arranged in a different order. So this book which we have in our hands we regard as the word of God. And though there are 66 books making it up, we believe that there is one author, that behind what was written was the hand of God causing the prophets to write. Now, one says, well, why these particular books? Um, was it because these were the only books available and therefore they were regarded as special? Well, obviously that wasn't the case. There was a time of much writing, not only in Israel, but uh, in Babylon and that many tablets have been found with writings on. So it, it wasn't a, a matter that um, these were the only writings. It was a time of much writing. So it wasn't because these were the only writings. And also... Interestingly, within the Bible itself, the Bible makes many references to other books which haven't been preserved. Uh, there's quite a, a list of them. The book of Jashir, the book of the wars of the Lord, the uh, book of the Acts of Solomon, uh, Chronicles of the Kings of Israel, Chronicles of the Kings of uh, Judah, not to be um, mixed up, uh, confused with our book of Chronicles. Book of Nathan, the seer, or the prophet, sorry, and Gad, the seer, the prophet of Ahijah. Book of Jehu, the son of Hanai, and the book of Shemiah, the prophet. These are books which we don't know anything about. They're referred to, but don't form part of the Old Testament. So, clearly, it's not because these books that we have here in the Old Testament were the only writings in Israel. There were many others which are referred to. And again, we can't say, well, these particular books are here because of the standing of their writers, because we have the book of Isaiah, but we also have a reference to Isaiah wrote the Acts of King Uzziah first and last, and they're not there. So it wasn't because, well, Isaiah was a prophet, therefore all his works are here. Uh, and we're told that Solomon wrote 3,000 proverbs. Well, we have a number of his proverbs, uh, 1,005 songs, but only some of them have been preserved. So the fact that Solomon has some works in here and not others indicates to us that there must have been a process of um, differentiation as to what should be preserved and what shouldn't. Uh, and we believe this wasn't left to human choice. This was God's choice choice. God chose which of the many writings that were in existence should form part of the Bible. And there's an interesting phrase, everything's up on the screens rather than turning them up because there's a number of slides here. When the Apostle Paul was writing about his Jewish companions, his nation, he had this very telling phrase about what was special about the Jews. What advantage then hath the Jew, or what profit is there of circumcision, much in every way, because unto them was committed the oracles of God. And that, that word committed is entrusted, and the oracles of God are the utterances of God. So Paul is saying what we regard as our Old Testament, that was entrusted to the nation of Israel to keep, and these were utterances from God. Uh, and that's why, as we go through the Old Testament, we're constantly coming across phrases that indicate that, well, these were words from God. These weren't words which were made up by the uh, particular person who received the words. He was just a mouthpiece. God was feeding into his mind words which he spake. So uh, a typical example, Exodus 19 here, Moses came and called for the elders of the people and laid before their faces all these words which the Lord commanded him. So God had told him to speak these things, and he spoke them, and they said, all that the Lord has said we will do. And, you know, as you go through, Hosea opens the word of the Lord that came unto Hosea. 
And Jeremiah says, to whom the word of the Lord came in the day. So the the writers who actually pen these words make it clear that these were not their own words, but these were words which had come from God. And uh, when we come to the New Testament, and the writer to the Hebrews says that God in old times spake by the prophets, but now he's spoken to us by the greatest prophet of all, his son. So God spoke to his people through the prophets. Some of their writings were written down and preserved. Others weren't preserved, but they came from God. And that's why we often use uh, this particular quote from Timothy, 2 Timothy 3.16, because it tells us that all of Scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's God breathed. These weren't words that they thought up themselves. They were inspired. God breathed into their minds, as it were, what to write. Uh, And therefore it is from God, and therefore we can use it for all manner of things. And Peter explains that prophecy didn't come by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And uh, that was a very powerful force upon them. They had to speak what God put in their minds. And there's an interesting little section in Jeremiah. Um, God tells Jeremiah, whatsoever I command you, uh, you've got to speak. And the message that Jeremiah had to take to the people wasn't a pleasant one. And Jeremiah, at a certain stage in his life, got fed up with saying all these terrible things that were going to happen to his people. And he has this to say, O Lord, thou hast deceived me, and I was deceived. Thou art stronger than I, and hast prevailed. I am in derision daily. Everyone mocketh me. And he goes on to say, Then I said, I will not make mention of him, nor speak any more in his name. So he said, I'm going to stop speaking God's word. But he couldn't. His word was in my heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones. And I was weary with forbearing. I could not stay. So he just had to speak, whether he wanted to or not. And as he spoke, then he wrote these words down. Um, It came to pass in the fourth year of Jehoiakim that this word came unto Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Take thee a scroll of a book and uh, write therein all the words that I have spoken to thee against Israel. So this indicates to us how the process worked, that God spoke in the ears, as it were, of his prophets, and the prophets were then impelled to record the message as well as speak the message to his people. So we believe that it was written down and given to the priests to look after. Uh, We can gain this information from quite early on, looking at the words of Moses, that Moses, we're told in Deuteronomy 31, Moses wrote this law and delivered it unto the priests, the sons of Levi, which bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord, uh, and unto all the elders of Israel. And a few verses uh, later on, we read that it came to pass when Moses had made an end of writing the words of this law in a book until they were finished, that Moses commanded the Levites, which bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord, saying, take this book of the law, put it in the side of the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God, that it may be there for a witness against thee. It wasn't actually put inside the Ark. Um, the word there is alongside. So in the most holy place we have the Ark, with its cherubim over it, and as scrolls were written, they were placed there by the priests so that they would be preserved. And we see Moses writing down the law, the first five books, handing them to the priests. So that when Moses dies and Joshua comes onto the scene, he's able to read what Moses has written. 
Um, the first chapter of Joshua is a, an exhortation to Joshua to be strong, to be courageous, to lead God's people. And he was told, this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth. You'll meditate upon it. Well, he had to be able to read it in order to um, meditate upon it. So a copy was there. He had access to that copy. So he was able to read it. And uh, as Joshua continues his life, he adds to what Moses has written. So the end of Joshua, Joshua chapter 24, Joshua wrote these words in the book of the law of God, took a great stone and set it up there under an oak that was by the sanctuary of the Lord. Now, I admit it doesn't specifically say that he gave it to the priest to put in the sanctuary, but we, we, do, we are told that it was by the sanctuary of the Lord that these things uh, took place where the priests were. So there was a, a process of continually adding to the books as God in, told the prophets, take this book, take it to the priest, preserve it. So as I say, Joshua continues where Moses left off, and it's interesting when we get uh, from Exodus right through to Chronicles, every book in the Hebrew Scriptures, not necessarily in the authorised version, but in the Hebrew Scriptures, starts with an and. In other words, we're continuing on from that scroll was there, now and this is the rest of the history, and it, it tags on one after the other. And so um, we read of in the time of Samuel, that Samuel told the people all the manner of the kingdom and wrote it in a book and laid it up before the Lord. And Samuel sent the people away. So there again, clear reference to what Samuel had been commanded to write was given to the priests to be laid up before the Lord by the ark. So simple process, prophet comes along with his scroll, gives it to the priest, the priest puts it uh, alongside the ark. And so there is uh, a preservation of master copies. And again, we can see God's great foreknowledge because God knew that there would be an unbroken chain of priests going right from the time of Moses right through to the time of the Lord Jesus. There wouldn't be an unbroken chain of prophets. Prophets would come, prophets would go. There would be times when there would be no prophets. But there was a priesthood. And so it, we can see God's foreknowledge in choosing the priests to be the ones um, who would be there and be able to preserve these records um, to New Testament times. And, of course, the priest's role was to take those books and read them for himself and use them to teach the people. They were the custodians, the expositors uh, of the word of God. And there's an interesting comment in the uh, law of Moses concerning when they would have a king, that one of the king's duties was to take the copy of the law and make his own copy so he could have that at his bedside, as it were. So, again, it all points to the fact that, you know, the, these copies were there uh, and they could be taken, copied, put back again. Uh, and everybody... Through, via the priesthood, had access to it. Um, the psalmist speaks of the, the person whose delight is in the law of the Lord. He meditates in it day and night. So, you know, it, there must have been people who were able to read it to the people so that they were able to learn it and take it in. Uh, Isaiah, seek ye out of the book of the Lord and read. Well, you know, that indicates that it was possible to do that kind of thing. And we read in the time of Daniel that Daniel understood from the record that Jeremiah had written earlier. He understood from books what Jeremiah had written, that there would be a 70-year captivity and the time had about come for that captivity to come to an end. So we see that each book's authority was fixed at the time when it was written. The fact that it was handed to the priest to be preserved was God's seal that I want this preserving. Not that one, not that one, but, you know, take this one to the priest. A, a simple, um, simple process wasn't left to later generations to pick what books they should regard as scripture. 
And the Old Testament writing finished when the prophets finished. There were no prophets for the last 400 years of Old Testament times. And therefore, there could be no scriptures, no prophets for God to speak to, no scriptures. And it's interesting that Josephus, who lived in the first century, um, time of the Lord Jesus and beyond, he makes this very point. He does a history of the Jews and says, you know, there were lots of books written uh, after the close of the Old Testament, but, um, well, let's just read it. It is true our history hath been written since Artaxerxes, very particularly, but hath not been esteemed of like authority with the former by our forefathers, because there hath not been an exact succession of prophets since that time. So no prophets, no special writings. And he says, and how firmly we give credit to those books of our nation is evident by what we do. For during so many ages as have already passed, no one has been so bold as either to add anything to them or take anything from them or to make any change in them. In other words, since the Old Testament closed 400 B.C., Nobody since then has said, oh, well, let's have this book, or let's take that book out. He said, no, we regard that as the word of God and unchangeable. We've got people who've written histories of what's happened in the between time, but that's not scripture. That hasn't been handed to the priest to be preserved. And you also, Josephus, bears testimony to the fact that there was this central record that was laid up in the tabernacle. Uh, in, well, in the temple, by that time, the temple had succeeded the tabernacle. Now that scripture, which is laid up in the temple, informs us, he says, uh, is expressed in the books laid up in the temple. And he says, last of all the spoils taken by Titus in AD 70 was carried the law of the Jews. So he bears testimony, and remember, he was a priest himself, so he knew what he was talking about. Josephus was a priest. So he knew that there were copies of God's word, right from Moses' copy, right through down to the last book of the Old Testament. And they were taken into uh, uh, exile, as it were, by the Romans in AD 70. So, simple process. Priests looked after the books, one central set of books, and from that central copy then uh, other copies could be made. And we know the fanatical care which Jews take even to this day of making sure that the copies that they make are accurately done. And they, and they count all the words and they know that when they get to the bottom of a page they should have so many letters on that page and if they haven't then they scrap it and start again. And we know from the Dead Sea Scrolls just how wonderfully accurate the transmission has been. So that's the Old Testament. So what are the New Testament? Well, uh, I'm sorry, that's a couple of slides on. Uh, it, what is also interesting is when we come to the New Testament and we have many references by Jesus and by the apostles, they only refer to Old Testament books that we have in our Bible. They don't make references to other apocryphal writings only to the writings which make up the scriptures. And the Lord Jesus frequently took his disciples and beginning at Moses and the prophets expounded from all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So uh, it's an important point that only quotations are made from what we have as our Old Testament. So, what about the New Testament process? Well, it was a similar one, and yet subtly different, and we'll see the reason why in a moment. Again, it was a time of much writing. Luke makes it clear that when he's giving his record, it wasn't because there were no other records. Many people have uh, written records, but they've not been preserved. Only four records of the Lord Jesus have been preserved. Um, and uh, when we come to Colossians, we read of a book which, Moses, which uh, Paul writes to the Colossian brethren. And he says that when this epistle, when you finish reading this book, send it over to the next meeting at Laodicea. 
And likewise, uh, get the copy of the, what I've sent to the Laodiceans and read that. Now, the book of Colossians has been preserved. It's in our New Testament. We haven't got what Paul wrote to the Laodiceans. So, obviously, you know, there were many writings made, and somehow there had to be a choice made. And when Paul wrote to the Corinthians, we have got 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, but in actual fact there was a letter which he sent before 1 Corinthians, so really 1 Corinthians should be 2 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians should be 3 Corinthians. Now, two of the letters that Paul sent have been preserved, but the first one hasn't. So who decided what should be preserved? You see, God couldn't say to... Paul, uh, right, I want this particular thing treating our scripture, take it to the priests and lay them up in the temple. Because if we have any knowledge of New Testament times, there was great enmity between the Jewish priesthood and these Christians. Great persecution. So that wasn't a channel that was available. And so another channel was appointed by God. And that was that there were spirit-gifted elders in the ecclesia who were known as prophets. And their task, one of their tasks, one of their many tasks, was to say which writings should be preserved, God-guided by his spirit. And if any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of God. So they were able to confirm, yes, what Paul is writing here is the commandments of God. This is part of his word. And there was an order of uh, duties or offices in the New Testament. And first were the apostles... And then second in ranking came the prophets and the teachers, miracle workers, gifts of healing, um, various things down the line. So a very important role were the prophets. And so not quite as Old Testament times because the message wasn't coming through the prophets, it was coming through the apostles. But God used these spirit-guided prophets to decide what was to be preserved and what wasn't. So the uh, authority was fixed almost straight away, soon after it had been written, so that New Testament writing, writers could quote other New Testament scriptures as scripture. Um, we have this example in 2 Peter 3.15, an account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved Brother Paul also, according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do the other scriptures unto their own destruction. So what Peter is saying, look, what the Apostle Paul has written is scripture. Of same weight as the Old Testament. And again, we find one writer quoting another. Uh, Timothy, when Paul writes to Timothy, he says, For scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the labourer is worthy of his reward. Now, the first part comes from Deuteronomy 25, so I have no, no problem, that is scripture. But the labourer is worthy of his reward is Luke chapter 10 and verse 7. Just very subtly different. Um, let's just go on the next slide. Uh, that says a reward and hire, but in the um, Greek, it's exactly the same word. So uh, there's Luke being quoted as Scripture, the words that Jesus had spoken. New Testament times, that is part of Scripture. And we come to Jude. Jude is able to talk about um, how that the apostles had talked about there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly lusts. 
And that's what Peter wrote about. Look at the end, knowing this first, there shall come in the last day scoffers walking after their own lust. So these were written down. Later writers could read them, use them, quote them. This was scripture. So we contend that the uh, selection of these books was done at the time by God. Old Testament by saying to the prophet, take it to the priest. New Testament times by the spirit gifted elders who were prophets to declare, yes, that's to be counted as scripture. It wasn't left a man to choose. Uh, And that gives us confidence that this is a book which uh, is what it claims to be, a a very special book, a holy Bible or separate book. This is unlike any other book that exists. This is God's book to mankind. And so the selection of books, we believe, was completed by about uh, by AD 100. By the time that Apostle John had penned the book of Revelation around about AD 96, you know, that was the New Testament closed, written, known about, uh, and confirmed. Uh, and we have fascinating confirmation of this fact uh, by a troublemaker. Uh, Marcion, born in AD 85 and died in AD 160, was the son of one of the bishops, and he had his own ideas. He was a bit of a heretic, and he rebelled against his father and said, no, this New Testament, uh, he threw out Matthew, Mark, um, John, and uh, Luke, he only preserved a few chapters, uh, and as far as the letters were concerned, He chopped them all out apart from ten letters of Paul. And because of this rebellion, he was disfellowshipped by his father. Now, the the, the important thing is that he writes very extensively about this. But what it is, he takes each of the 27 books that we have as our New Testament and says, well, I'm going to reject that one, or I'm going to accept that one, or a bit of that. He doesn't refer to any other than the 27 that we say were fixed early on. So, uh, as a very backhanded way, you might just have to think about this, but a very backhanded way, this is uh, a wonderful confirmation that the other believers had accepted by this time that he was writing that this was scripture. And this young man thought he knew better. So it it gives us that confidence that this is the word of God, that it is true from the beginning. So he was writing about AD 144. So that's what the Bible claims. It is true from the beginning. This is a book that we can trust. So why 66 books of the Bible? Well, you might have wondered... Um, why we read from Exodus chapter 26 about the construction of the lampstand. This was in the holy place in the tabernacle that Moses has set up. You've got a a table of showbread, uh, incense altar, and then the candlestick or light lampstand, which gave illumination. There were thick curtains and boards uh, over this, so the only illumination came from the seven lamps on the lampstand. And God was very particular that they had to build it a certain way. It had to be all of one piece, an absolutely incredible piece of workmanship to beat um, out of gold this shape of a lampstand with its lamps. And we're given very specific details about the construction of it. Um, It it was made up of three elements, uh, a bowl, a knot, and a flower. And each branch had three of those uh, three-piece flowers, as it were. Uh, So a bowl, a knot, and a flower. I believe that the bowl was probably the calyx part, what what, uh, encloses the bud to begin with. Uh, the knop would be the, the seeds inside uh, and the flower. Now, this was most unusual because uh, 
when the, you get seed in the seed pod, the flowers have fallen. But this is, you know, this is a, a representation, I believe, of an almond blossom uh, with these three parts to it. And so um, a, a, a calyx, a seed pod, and a flower. And that duplicated three times as we go up the lampstand. And so there were three lampstands, three branches, sorry, going out on one side. So we've got 27 elements there. As we go up the middle, again, we have these same three-part flowers, but there are four of them. So we've got 12 of them, so we've got 39 so far. And then on the other side, exactly the same construction, and so we have 27 elements there. So we add all those up and we get 66, which just so happens to be the number of books in the Bible. Now, when we look at uh, how our Bible comes together, the Old Testament, if we count up all the books uh, up to uh, the end of Daniel, we have 27 books corresponding to the branches going out there. The uh, minor prophets are 12 corresponding to the uh, central shaft, and then that's the 39 books there. And then when we come to the New Testament, it means we know we've got 27 books there so that, that, that all corresponds to the construction of the lampstand but I made the comment earlier that the Hebrew Bible was different wasn't it it only had 22 books and uh, that was through amalgamating various books um, so the Samuel and the Kings and the Chronicles and the Ezra and Nehemiah and all the minor prophets being put together. So if we just um, look at the lampstand from the Hebrew Bible perspective, as it were, and then instead of thinking of those as um, a three-part flower, that, that is one flower made of three parts, but we concentrate, well, that, that's one flower, two flowers, three flowers, and then uh, three branches, so we've got nine flowers there, we've got one, two, three four flowers there, so four there, and obviously the other side we've got another nine, which adds up to the 22. Now, if you look at the construction of the Hebrew Bible, as I say, we've got Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, uh, Joshua, Judges, and then uh, Samuel and Kings add together. Uh, so if we count up the number of books we've got to there, uh, I believe my maths is correct, we've got nine books there, then looking at the prophets, because the minor prophets are all lumped together, we have another four books which correspond to that central shaft. And then on the other side, because Ezra and Nehemiah and Chronicles are one book, if you add those up, we've got nine books there. So corresponding to the branches on the other side. So if we look at it from that point of view, then the same lampstand, which is telling us about the Hebrew Bible with its 22 books, is also at the same time telling us about God's completed word uh, with its 66 books with the same symbol. Now, I, I defy anybody, any mathematician, to think of a symbol that will convey those two matters long before the book was written. Remember, this was uh, constructed in the time of Moses when Moses hadn't even written the five books of the law. So there was no... Um, no Old Testament at this time. And yet God was foreshadowing in this wonderful way the 22 books of the Hebrew Bible, the 66 books of the completed Bible. And what a symbol to use to convey that. This lampstand speaks to us of light and illumination. And that's how scripture speaks of the word of God. It is like a lampstand because it does illuminate us. It, it guides us as to how we should walk. And so, you know, how fitting that God used that particular symbol to convey this information about the word of God. The light of the knowledge of the glory of God. This is what the Bible is telling us about, the glory of God, his plan, his purpose, his character, his son, all contained. This is light that gives us knowledge. And uh, uh, back to that uh, scripture there, we can have this confidence that if God is so 
incredibly clever to be able to do that, then we can be sure that this is his word and we can trust it implicitly and that it will guide us, it will teach us, it will instruct us um, to the things of God. So, as I say, it was a slightly different view of the Bible, but one that is very important because it gives us confidence that this is the word of God.